Uh, good morning and really thank you. I expected four people, two who would be related to me <laughs> and then <laughs> Yadu and uh, Subodh because they were so gracious in inviting me. So I'm really thankful to see so many of you who made this choice to spend the next 30, 40 minutes uh, with me in this room. Uh, I want to start by saying I've just come out of a conversation with my younger son who wanted to know what was the title of this talk and he was outraged. He said, how can you structure a sentence like this? What do you mean by the social in the act of reading? So he said, I wanted to be provocative. I wanted to incite people to wonder what it is about. He said, you're going to fail. So I'm starting, <laughs> I'm starting on a very insecure footing. Uh, but uh, I, I'm hoping to get through this uh, morning because I have thought uh, a lot about what I'm going to talk to you about. And I've struggled actually to put it together in a concise way. So you'll really help me see whether what I'm thinking is really an idea that I can uh, share with more uh, people. Uh, what do I click? Yeah, so I, this one? Wonderful. Uh, so I want to start by inviting you into a text. It's a text that is spoken. It's a form called the spoken word poem. And uh, it's performed in this piece by a young, uh, in comparison to me, everyone is young. So a young poet called Anis Mojgani. Uh, and uh, this piece was, uh, the opening act of a music show. So uh, you may see some elements of a concert, but that's not what I'm getting into. Come closer. Come into this. Come closer. What beautiful battlefields you are. You are quite the beauty. If no one has ever told you that before, know that right now, you are quite the beauty. There is joy in how your mouth dances with your teeth. Your smile is simply a sign of how sacred your life actually is. So step into it. Come closer. Know that whatever God prays to, he asked of it to make something of worth. He woke from his dreams, scraped soil from the spaces, stuck somewhere inside himself. He made you. He made you when he was happy. You make the world happy. Come into this. Come closer. Know that something softer than us but just as holy planted pieces of himself into our feet that we might one day dance our way back. Know that you are almost home. Come just a little bit closer. There are birds beating their wings beneath your breastplates. Gentle sparrows that ache to sing. Come aching hearts. Come soldiers of joy. Dormant of truth. Know that my heart was too big for my body, so I let it go. In most days, this world has thinned me to the point where I'm just another cloud, forgetting another flock of swans. But believe me when I tell you that my soul has managed to squeeze itself into such narrow spaces Place your hand beneath your head when you sleep tonight, and perhaps you will find it there. Making beauty as we sleep, as we dream, as we turn over, when we turn over in the ground. May the ghosts that we have asked answers of do that turning, kneading us into crumbs of light and into this thing, love thing called life. Come into it. Come, you wooden museums, gentle tigers, little giants. I see teacups upside down, glowing across your grins. Your hearts are like my hands. Some days all they do is tremble. I am like you. I'm like you. I too at times am filled with so much fear, but like a hallway must find the strength to walk through it. Walk through this with me, through this church of blood, bone, and muscle that is our lives. There is a doorknob glowing like chance before you. Grab it, turn and pull, swing. Step through, back straight, chin up, eyes open, hearts loud. Walk through this with me. Walk through this with me. Welcome to Heavy and Light. So I work in interactive spaces and I'd just like for two minutes for any of you to share what you felt when you heard this poem. Uh, 
you felt empathy? Yeah, and I felt that I've been through this. He knows what I've been through. Ah, so someone who understands. Yeah. Hmm? And I was waiting to see what happens. I know. So I apologized. <laughs> I'm. I can't put up a rock concert, but. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I wish I had a text to take back to read through again because some things were so fast and yes. I kind of think about what you said. Yes. So I do have the, the, the words and I'll email them to you, but that's a really great example of a reading brain that's uh, listening, feeling, but also sometimes wanting to focus on the print. Any words that kind of suddenly resonated when you heard that piece? Touching. Touching. Uh, the words touched you. Any word in particular? Any phrasing in particular? Happy. Happy yeah. Okay. Come closer. Come closer. Just the urging of you. Yeah. Something like how beautifully somebody's teeth reverberated with a smile. Right. That your lips dance with your teeth is the kind of, yeah, metaphors that, uh, metaphoric phrasing he uses, yeah. The upside down cup and then the grin that emerges from the upside down cup, yeah. Back straight. Hmm, yes. Chin up, eyes forward. Mm, blood and bone. Uh, it's a, a little stronger and much more powerful. Than right. Than if we perhaps just read it as well. You think? Yeah, I mean, the way he he brought it, yeah. brought that emotion yeah. out. Yeah. And he came also close by saying, I'm like you. So yeah. Was, yes. Was yes. Yes. That I'm just like you. I'm just like you. I'm just like you. Yes. And my heart trembles. Did you get that one? Like your hands? Yeah. I mean, a kind of uh, comparison we'd really just put together, no? Yeah. The way, yes, yes, yes. So I think that's the strength of the form. Just spoken word poetry has, it's so performative that that's the, what the form brings and each form will bring some quality. And that's definitely what this form brings. But I'm now going to ask you to actually think that what has happened to us in the last uh, four minutes. We watched a poem and we've responded to it. What, you know, what other form can actually do this? Is just dispel words into an audience, allow us to imagine, feel, think, come together, and just feel a oneness that we didn't feel even seven minutes ago. Am I fair in making this claim? That somehow this text has done something to us? So at its very, very simplest, uh, this is uh, perhaps the simplest uh, um, you know, uh, exposition of what one may mean by social in the act of reading. The, the fact that as a society, as a community, reading itself can bring us together. But today I actually want to uh, move beyond this and I'm hoping I'm going to be able to, uh, cool. oh, to, to get there. Uh, I really want to spend a little bit of time thinking really what is it about reading? Is, is reading really only about the fact that I escape into a book, I draw joy or pleasure or ideas from a book, or by listening to a story, you and I are in interaction with each other? Uh, is, it, is it just this, or is it, oh, is it something more? Uh, and I want to, uh, I will introduce you to a couple of uh, people who uh, I almost imagine I know because I spent time reading them, 
Uh, they of course have no idea I exist in the world. But their ideas have deeply shaped the way I think about reading. And I want to introduce you to uh, Paulo Freire, who uh, was a Brazilian educator. Uh, this clip is from his very last interview when he was 75. Uh, he, in many ways for the world, changed the way we look at literacy. And literacy, uh, for the longest time in history, was looked at as simply the act of reading and writing, as though these were mechanical skills you learned. Uh, and they were functional. They allowed you to do something. So it was how you learned to use a knife and fork. They are passive, inanimate. You learn it, and it enables you to do something. And he questioned that, acted on it, and has done in his lifetime amazing work with adults in reimagining literacy. So I just want you to listen to him because there's some joy in listening to, to thinkers. So what I want to draw on is the idea that reading itself uh, is dynamic. It has potential to do so many, many things. And it is not just an isolated skill that you teach or that you use to inform you about something else. But the act of reading itself uh, begins to shape the way you think. And, uh, oh, sorry, no. I, I extracted one paragraph which I feel so strongly informs the work that we do at Bookworm. Uh, and I've, the highlighted bits are my own because I feel they are the lodestones of what we do. Where we look at literacy, and this is Freire's words, is not merely a technical skill to be acquired, but as a form of cultural politics. Literacy is viewed as a set of practices that either empowers or disempowers people and is analyzed according to whether it serves to reproduce existing social formations or serves as a set of cultural practices promoting democratic change. So for me, in this kind of a text, in this kind of a paragraph, lies the impetus of why reading is important, why this act of sharing uh, the possibilities of reading texts, discussions around texts, uh, the potential actually lies in this kind of an approach that it is not just entertainment, it is not just personal engagement, refuge, uh, solace, it is all that, but it also has an enormously powerful potential to change the way we think. And for us, one way in which we work with communities, children, teachers, who may have not had the privilege of being born into literate cultures, is to recognize that your world is very rich and that world experience you bring will inform what you bring to a text. And I love this sentence of Freire's, which is that reading the world always precedes reading the word. So your experience, your way of thinking about things, what you know before you come to read something is going to impact what you read. And I must acknowledge that and respect that. And once we become readers, that's not an end in itself. Because reading the word implies continually reading the world. Because of what you read, you're going to be shaped in the way you think, and then you're going to act in the world. So while it's a rather simple sentence, it actually, for me, carries enormous weight. And it's something we hold quite close in the way we try and practice uh, what I will move on to call the act of reading. So really, what do we speak of when we speak of, uh, speak of reading? And today, for at least the next few minutes, I actually want to talk about the process of reading in terms of all the activity that is happening inside our brain. Many of us uh, readers who actually read with immense ease, who uh, you know, take the act of reading for granted, uh, really pause to think that this is a highly complex cognitive operation that's happening inside your brain. And for me, this whole dramatic imagination of, of reading being social also comes from here. I've been greatly influenced by the work uh, of, of, a, of a scholar called Marion Wolf, And I, I read her first book many, many years 
back, which was Proust and the Squid. And it was the study of science and the reading brain. And for 17 years, we never heard from her. And just a couple of uh, months back, um, she released this book called Reader Come Home. And uh, this is the reading brain in the digital world. And it couldn't have come at a more important time when we are all so confused about where we stand with respect to form. What is happening when we are reading more on digital media than print? Uh, we are worried. Many people say to me, but you work in the library, isn't that a dead space? Who's reading? Which children read? We don't read. Uh, and for some reason, in a very naive way and not not uh, for any fault of ours, we've limited the act of reading to the form, that reading is what is printed. But reading is not what is printed on, on paper. Reading itself is, a, is an act of us looking at something, making sense of it, and drawing meaning, storing, responding, recording, uh, a, a highly complex set of of uh, cognitive uh, operations in our brain. And so there was this really wonderful statement by a group of teachers many years back in the early 2000s, where a seminar was dedicated to this topic called reading is rocket science. And it came from this danger that we are simplifying reading to a set of skills that you learn your phonics, you're able to read, you look at the sight, see and sight way method, you drill certain spelling words and you're able to read. These are parts of helping you to become a literate person. But reading is more, more than just this. So if I draw back to Marion Wolf, she has this illustration in her book. And I don't have the vocabulary to, to articulate how beautifully she describes these circles as, as acts in a circus. And if you'll bear with me for a minute, I'm going to read from her, her text what she says. To bring to life the multiple simultaneously happening operations in the reading brain that occur every time we read a single word. Please note this happens when you read a single word. I can think of no better visual metaphor than a three ring circus. Not just any three ring circus, but one filled with actors and fantastic creatures only imaginable in a Cirque du Soleil tent where magic trumps credibility. And she asks us in this text to turn our attention to these big rings. And this is just one hemisphere of your brain. And this is when we are reading a word. When you look at an image, a similar circus is happening. And when you're looking at image and text together, you can just imagine what's happening in your brain. And it's, it's mind-boggling, but it's something we really, really pause to think about. And so I wanted to share this thanks to, you know, being in the 21st century and this whole area of uh, MRI scanning. Reading research actually is able to really look at our brains while we read. And this was a study which was done on young children between the ages of six to eight, capturing their brains while they were looking at books with pictures and books without pictures, books that with pictures are being read aloud, and books where the child is sitting alone with a, with a book. And this particular slide I wanted to share just to show you if that's your scan of the brain. If you can see the lit up parts, you get a sense of what lights up when you hear, when you see, when you speak, and when you think about words. And this is only your language center. We're not yet looking fully uh, uh, at what happens in more complex processes, like being on Instagram and I don't know, all those wonderful uh, spaces where multiple forms are talking, <coughs> talking to you. So uh, each of you is a Christmas tree, actually, on the inside, uh, lit up all the time. And this was something that really interested me some years back, and so I'm sharing it, is we do tend to think that 
I read when I was in college and then I've stopped reading. Or now we don't read, we do something else. But the brain is a highly um, plastic, it has high plasticity. And it builds these connections and it also loses these connections when we stop doing certain things. And so many of us who are readers and who perhaps have stopped reading, or many of us who have shifted our form of reading and we feel that is okay. It might be okay, we don't know enough yet, but we are also forming connections and losing connections in our brain. And these scans actually show uh, how our neural systems get organized and wired when you read and write. And as you can see the difference between the first and the last, you will see that that both reading and writing and talking have an impact on these connections. So for me, this is all part of this activity that we refer to when we say the act of reading. The act of reading is not just a real time act. It's also something that's happening all the time in your mind. And so just very quickly, the act of reading is not just obvious at a surface level. It is an invisible complex activity in our brains. It is true, it is something we have still not fully understood. It's changing fast, very fast. And like Marianne Wolf says, she took 17 years to write this text. And she says, I emerged out of my rabbit hole and the world has changed again. Because of the affordances of technology, it, things are changing so fast that research is not really where reading is concerned, being able to keep pace at the moment. But we've got to do what we can, the best we can, in where we are. So really, what does one do in a practice around the act of reading, given the kind of uh, sharing I just did? Uh, we, to a great extent, bumble along and have fun while doing that. But we also are determined, in many ways, to keep inciting children and adults to know for themselves, to think for themselves. And this idea of thinking and knowing what's possible, uh, for me, has come largely from the work of a cognitive psychologist called Jerome Bruner. And I love when somebody brings us to story. And for me, he's one of those thinkers who actually argued strongly for what is called the narrative mode of, think, of, of being informed, of thinking that the best way to understand, he says, is actually through the mode of storytelling. It could be anything, but it is in a narrative form. And uh, he argues it quite interestingly, so I very quickly put up five points, was that he felt at the time that cognitive science was looking too narrowly at logical, systemic aspects of mental life, that you, know, you had to do certain mechanical operations to sharpen your thinking. He said there was another side to the mind, and that was the act of imagination that only human beings have, and that allows us to make our experiences powerful. And this side of the mind, he felt, is what leads us to stories, dramas, rituals, myths, uh, being interested in, in tales, in historical accounts. And he called this mode in order to argue it the narrative mode. Uh, and he strongly felt that these mental acts that allow us to enter these imaginative spaces uh, are really what is, is the foundation for how we understand the world and in turn even how we begin to understand ourselves. And we do know this loosely. We all say reading helps you get to know yourself. Reading helps you understand the world. Uh, reading helps you go places you may not go, it allows you to build empathy, it allows you to, you know, travel without moving. It's all that. I'm just trying to lay the grid of where this is coming from. It's, these are, this is not loose, empty talk. We've sadly, I feel, reached a time where we are dismissing reading as something quite casual. It's not, at least in my uh, point of view. And because I love introducing people to people like this, uh, I got a very short clip of Jerome Bruner, who worked until he was 99. And this is the last interview in his office. Uh, I wanted you to listen to him. It's a clip of a minute and a half or something. So this imagination, because we are asked a lot in our work, you know, how do you promote the reading culture? How do you uh, 
uh, I don't know, s insight a reading culture, uh, or, uh, almost as if this idea of a reading culture is fixed and one has to make it happen again, or that it was in the past and now we've moved somewhere else. And I like the thinking that culture is not fixed. Culture is what is happening, what is the possible all the time based on where we are and what we can do to go somewhere. And I love Bruna's words of the actual and the possible. And so at Bookworm, these really are our foundations. We, we know what is actual. We're working with so many children and young people who think reading is hard or reading is impossible or reading is boring. And we have a possible of, of knowing what the act of reading can actually do to, to you, to your life, to the way you think and to society. And so we actually try and drive our work in this way. And so for the next few slides, I just very quickly want to walk you through just some big snapshots of some of the um, joyful uh, and hardworking ways in which we try and make what is actual possible. Uh, we believe very strongly in the act of reading aloud, irrespective of the age, stage, uh, backgrounds of anyone. We love reading aloud, knowing very strongly uh, that the relationship and the the social that is enacted when you read a text to somebody and you all come together around that text is perhaps one of the most lingering experiences around reading that you carry. And that has an effect on you going to a text on your own. Uh, we do fairly dramatic things uh, by reading in public places, setting up Pop up, what we call in pop-up libraries to become trendy, but they are actually just dharis with books. Uh, and we start reading to groups. We've done these in uh, the bus stop. We've once gone into the ferry boat and done it. We've done in public parks. They almost seem maverick and mad, but there is a, <laughs> there is a logic <laughs> behind it. Sometimes only we know this. <laughs> but these for all of us and for the team I work with are acts of joy because suddenly our world uh, opens up and we really have a mad crazy day around reading but we know that when people say ah I remember you from this that it's left a impact. We've uh, quite interestingly uh, embarked on making sure we have a online presence. Uh, we uh, hold through Bookworm uh, one of the only online journals on libraries uh, in the subcontinent. It's called Torchlight uh, and it it's comes out every uh, three months and it's right now the only repository that's documenting work being done in the space of libraries by NGOs and communities all over India. I urge you to look for uh, Torchlight online. It's just a free subscription to, I think, a really definitive online journal. Uh, we try very hard to keep an active blog because we have uh, hundreds of followers. The fascinating thing for me in Goa is there are more people from out of Goa who follow Bookworm than people in Goa <laughs> who follow Bookworm. And that says something about something, but we can think about it at another time. Uh, and, and Bookworm has an active website. We've been working in the last three years very ferociously with adults and mostly teachers and other NGO workers because we feel this burning need to be sharing now what we've learned and understood. Uh, and it's delightful to encounter groups of adults who think, oh, this is a children's book, and, and then spend half an hour and 45 minutes talking about that book. And this is because such incredible books for children that are now available. Many of us just missed that publishing window. And so we still think that, oh, those were the books for children. But we urge you to come into Bookworm uh, and look at our collection. We really have a definitive collection. We have people who come from out of Goa again to spend three days just to read in the library. Uh, so please, please, it's an open library and please come. So we run courses for library educators. We run courses for public librarians in children's sections and for teachers. 
We embarked on a very exciting project uh, last year, which was documenting stories of communities that live along the river Mandavi in Goa. And uh, this was an amazing harvest, really, for us, because we met communities we imagined we knew, but we entered their life because of storing. And there was sharing, and there was uh, harnessing, and then there was uh, producing uh, art murals. Uh, uh, so we have uh, 13 such murals now, uh, beautifully drawn by 13 different communities. And uh, we're hoping sometime this year to do a giant exhibition and put it all together. This project is called Nai, which means river in, in Kokani.
Thank you.